I'm sorry we're late. That's okay. People are anxiously waiting. Hello, Mr. Friedman. How are you? Nice to meet you. Can I help you? Thank you. How do you want her to call you? Uh, she can call me Peter. Okay. Okay, are you okay? I'm yeah, we fine. have to rush uh -huh. through lunch. So. Okay. My name is Rose. Rose, okay. Yeah. I'm, okay, I met you at the uh, at the play about a month ago. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah, okay. Watch your fingers. Okay. Ready? Okay, okay, she's here. Mom, do you remember when you spoke at the play? Yes. Yeah, Peter came right. and said hello to you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. This is a put on by a group called the Sholom Center. And I, those of you in my class, I can help you have you heard about it. And uh, it was a play about the, the, the fire. It was a, sort of a recreation of it. Um, and before the play began, one of the, I think, I guess the director of the play said if we have a surprise for the audience. There are about 600 people in the audience. And he introduced Arlene March, who is uh, Mrs. Friedman's daughter, who is a local therapist. Um, and then she, he introduced Mrs. Friedman. And he um, told everybody that she is the last survivor of the Triangle Fire. Of course, 600 people gasped. Um, and then she stood in front of the stage. You probably remember this, right? She stood in front of the stage <laughs> on her feet. Can I get her? No. Right? Oh, no, no, no. no talking for about 15 minutes to a crowd of 600 people without a microphone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it was very impressive. So at the, um, at the intermission, I went, they were sitting in the front row, I went down to the front row and I asked Mrs. Friedman and uh, Mrs. March if they would mind coming to um, speak to the class or we'd go to that, we'd go to her place. And she said she'd be happy to come over here. And so. Um, took a while to arrange the time, but uh, they both really graciously agreed to, to spend some time with us today. Um, the class knows about the Triangle Fire. We saw a documentary about it. The rest of you, I've already passed out a, um, a short description of the Triangle Fire. Please don't read it while we're in the middle of this. But there is a, uh, a website at Cornell University about the Triangle Fire with all kinds of first-hand descriptions. There's a number of books that have written about it and so forth. There's even a Hollywood movie that was made about it. So you can fill yourself, uh, fill in about it later. So uh, the format is pretty open. Um, I asked Arlene and, and Mrs. Rivers, they simply talk about your experiences coming to this country and getting a job and, and then ultimately about the, the fire itself. And then we'll open up for questions. And when you're too tired, um, we'll just and oh, okay. she's never tired, water? I can tell you that. She might like some water. Okay. Yeah, some she's water. definitely a, a night owl. Um, <laughs> my mother, I, I will tell you this, though, my mother's a little hard of hearing. She she was just celebrated her 107th birthday, uh, March 27th. Yeah. So, so I may have to repeat the questions, okay? Okay, Mom, Mom, would you like to start just by telling everybody when you came to America and how yeah. you came to work at the factory yeah. and what happened? Okay. Okay? Go ahead. Start. I used to live. I used to live in... in no, tell the story about when, when you first came to America. Yeah, okay. How old were you? What? How old were you? What year was it? Oh, I was about 15. Okay. When I came to the United States, I was only 15 years old. But my father was here two years ahead of me, and my sister and my mother came recently, I mean at that time. So my mother rented right away an apartment for my daddy, for my, for my father, and my, because my sister didn't want to go back. She loved it. New York. And I went back with my mother, and after two years, I started, my sister was, had a very good position in an exporting house, and I was just taking care of the house. One day, my sister came home and upset the whole apartment, and I said to her, Molly, I worked so hard to get this in shape, and you're messing it up. And she said, worked? Who worked? Well, that did it. The next day, I was out for a job, all by myself. I went out. It was right after the strike in Triangle Wheels Company. 
And they, a lot of people left, and they needed somebody. I wasn't a seamstress. I, I knew a little English, though, and they hired me. They wore the machine that you put a button in on your blouse, it goes through it. You don't need any language or any ability. Well, I worked there two, two years. And one day, and there were three flights in that building. Eight, ninth, and ten. I was on the ninth. On the eighth, one day, a fire broke out on the eighth floor. Nobody came to tell us that there was a fire. You remember the date? Yeah, sure. March 20, uh, April 20. March 25th. March 25th. I got 1911, yeah. right. Okay. And, that was right before her birthday. Finally, it was two days before her finally, 18th birthday, exactly. Finally, we felt, we smelled the smoke. And we started to run towards the door. The door was locked. Well, what was left? The fire escape. Everybody ran to the fire escape. And it, there was a big panic. Everybody was running, crying. You know, you can imagine. And I, a little girl, sitting all by myself, figured, I, I want to know what the executive said about. And I ran to the tenth floor, from ninth to the tenth. But when I came up, they saved themselves. There was nobody there. Well, I walked another floor. To, that was on the tent. And I wanted to go up because it was no way of going down. And I see there was a big window and there was the, the, and there were three or four steps, you know, there. And the flames were very over. But I took a chance. I took my dress over my head and I ran through. Finally, I was on the roof. And I came on the roof, the firemen were there. And I had tears in my eyes. I figured, my God, if only they would go down and open the door and see if they didn't see anyone. They wanted to save the building, not help the people. And I was crying. And I went down, so there was another building adjacent, but was higher like that. So one fireman from the other side and one fireman from my roof helped me to get up. And I walked down 10 floors crying and sitting on every step. And when I came in the street, my, my father was waiting. But he gave one look at me, the eyebrows look on everything. And I was black like, you know. And he he fainted. And the ambulance took him away. But he came back home the same day. And a woman was there, and she said to me, Rose, is it you or your shadow? We told you were there. Can you imagine? And then, I, then first I realized how lucky I was. That was then. What happened though, Ma? Tell everybody what happened oh, yeah. after the fire. And then, and then one day, one of the men, you know, from the owners, met me, and they wanted to bribe me, and they asked me to say that the doors were open. I said, nothing to do. I won't do it. They want to give me a lot of money. I said, no. I don't do such. It's a shame. And that was then. Well, well, you know, uh, the investigation, of course, revealed that the doors had been locked. Actually, my mother wasn't. I, I won't say she wasn't aware, but from what? where she was, what I've learned subsequently in reading about the fire is that on the ninth floor there were two doors. One door was originally open, and some of the employees that were on that end were able to get out. But when the flames broke off that half of the room, the other door, which was where my mother was working, that was always locked. So what happened is that with the investigation, of course, they discovered that the girls who died. My mom, we forgot to tell them that the, the, the girls, yes. of course, went out no, on the... One, one, one oh, excuse me. 
146 people died in a half hour. How? How did they die? What? Why did they die? Why did they? Because of what do you mean why? Why not? Because the fire escaped. You forgot to tell them. So there was nothing left when the doors were closed, locked. They had to run to the fire escape. Everybody ran to the fire escape. Fire escape broke and all the people died. Yeah, so well, that's that's the point is that the girls who were all on that half of the you know the room, the ninth floor, um, were, were the flames cut them off from the other door, so the only door they had was locked, and they all went to the fire escape, and of course the fire escape broke away, and and girls jumped to their death at the window. My mother, of course, is it's amazing that she decided not to go down. She decided to go up. The story that I think we all know is that the executives did in fact go up to the roof. If you have any questions. Yeah, well wait one minute. I, well, I, I, well, let me just finish because I just want to give this little bit of story. Mom, wait, wait a minute. I'm talking. One minute. One minute. Okay, in, in, last year we received a letter from a, a family in Boston saying uh, they wanted to know if my mother had long dark hair and escaped through the tent on the roof because they heard from their grandfather that he was a college student in that adjacent building and that apparently the, the executives and, and staff from the 10th floor did in fact go up to the roof and the college students in that adjacent building had actually put down a ladder and the, the executives did ascend the ladder and went down but they didn't expect anyone else up, and so they left, and they took the ladder with them. When my mother arrived, there was no one there but a fireman on each roof. So th this family's grandfather was a student who helped a girl with long, dark hair, and they were hoping that it was my mother, <laughs> which would have been a nice story, but unfortunately it wasn't my mother, because when she got there, there were no college students, and there was no ladder. But she being petite, they, they literally just hoisted her up to the, to the next building. Okay, I'm sorry. You want to ask a question? Um, was it common practice to lock the doors to lock you in during the day? Well, yeah. Mom, let me let me make sure she heard you. Mom, I'm mom, was the door always locked? Was oh. that something? Oh. Why? Because they were afraid that the people go and steal and get away with the merchandise. And the inspectors okay that. They were all the same. Yeah. Fire trips. Can you explain? I can well, I know how they get on fire. Yeah. Why she didn't take that the drive? Oh, well, I could tell you my mother. Okay. Yeah. Like Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Mom. 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 That camera is going to be a distraction for her. Anyway, um, Mom, why didn't you consider taking the bribe? Why, why didn't you take the bribe, the money they offered Oh, you? no, I would never do it. <laughs> you know, it was on my mind how innocently those people died. Why, why would I be mean and take money? And then I was against it. They were wrong, you know. And uh, I put the blame on the city and on the firemen because if there wouldn't have been anybody there, it's different. But they were, within five minutes, less than five minutes, they would have walked out, you know, not continue the outside, saving the outside, you know. That wasn't fair. But I didn't see any dead ones. I was very lucky. That was a different angle. A different you angle, see? yeah. With the, I don't know if you know New York, but there's a college there. In why you? You know, that was a decent the college. Oh, no, that was the law school. But after that, I didn't go to work anymore. I went to school. I went to college. No more. Could you tell us how the wages, what the wage was, and uh, the benefits and the hours? Mom? How many hours did you work? What oh. hours, Mom? And how much were you paid? Oh, yeah. I, they were used to pay like two or three dollars a week. But everything was very reasonable. And like a lot of them came from Russia. Like 
Oh, and apparently we had five children. Everybody brought their paycheck. And the rent was cheap. Everything was cheap. But that was underpaid. I used to get mine after two years. It was, I wasn't considered actually as a seamstress. I was mostly with the, with the um, what do you call them, and executives. And I was very educated considering. I was only 18 years old after the fire. And I had command of four languages, and then it went to six. I was a translator. Later. For, for, for a steamship company, they don't exist now, and they never hired any women, but they need the language that I had command of. She worked for the Cunard Lines I remember, in her 20s. They run the QE2 now. Yeah, right? Uh-huh. Uh you took how many hours you worked? Uh, yeah, how many hours did you work for $9 oh, a boy. The hours, I can't tell you. It was more than 48, I mean, maybe more, you know. Yeah, six days a week, at least eight hours. Well, day. they're mostly immigrants from Russia. They were strong girls, you know, tall. And they didn't have any ability to do anything. They didn't have any trade, none. So, and the owners took advantage. He must have been Russian too. On her floor, in the ninth floor, yeah, there were a lot of Russian girls. I understand on the eighth so floor, there were a lot of Italian. Kind of, you know, I children. didn't associate much with them, you know. I couldn't communicate with them. Yes. Actually, did you have any friends in the, in the factory? Yeah. Actually, did you have any friends I there? Had, yes, I had one poor lady, and I remember her name. You know, they shortened it. Her, her name was Rappaport. They shortened it to Rep. <laughs> you know, she was the only one that we could talk to. And they ate them, they brought their lunch there. They, they looked to be happy. They didn't know any better. So, and I remember the name of the owners. Do you know, I have a very good memory. It was back to five years, when I was five years old. <laughs> yes. If I'm, uh, I'm trying to write a book. Three miracles in one lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did have miracles. What were the other two? Besides that. Ah. The other two? Do you really want to hear it? It's not related to here. your work. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah. sort of. Thank you. Thank you. No, part of me, anyway. Mom. Mom. See, she sees the camera. She freezes. Mom. <laughs> Mom. You don't have to look at the camera. Listen. Peter wants to know, what were the other two miracles? Oh, <laughs> well, after that trial, you know, I come from Vienna. I was born in Vienna. My grandparents live in the outskirts. It belongs to Austria. My grandparents didn't believe that I was alive. So my mother wanted to surprise them, took me along. Well, came to my grandparents' house. And over there, like here, on Friday, they usually is a stranger to have dinner with them, you know, like a soldier or... My mother's Jewish Friday night is, is Sabbath, and so, so that's what they did at her, her grandparents' home. Okay. One evening on Friday, we were all united. We heard some steps in a, in a door. You know, the steps are heavy door. A man was sitting with us. I didn't know who he was. I, did, I knew him by the first name. The Cossacks stepped in with the door and approached me and asked me, do you know this and this man? I said, no. The name, no. And meanwhile, 
they were looking around, and the men that were sitting there, he knew that they were there. He, he recognized already the heavy steps, the you boots. know. I said to him, Johnny, come follow me. And if he went to the living room, and the living room was a big armor uh -huh. covering, covering uh -huh. a door adjacent to a, to a room that was empty. When they came up the steps, before they came in to open, they tried the door it was locked. Well, when I, when he was begging me to save his life, I said, you know what? You go behind that armor, armor like this, and be between the door and the armor. When you hear the steps, you go in, in the room. You know, when they left. Well, when I came out, who's standing? A big Cossack with the dog. The dog smells me already. And I had presence of mind. And I said, my dear men, we are not, we are Americans. We have no interest, neither in Austria nor in Russia. I said, you just doing the job for nothing. You better leave. So they left, and they took my grandfather mm -hmm. And we didn't sleep the whole night. What did you do with the man? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Before you went to sleep, where did you put the man? OK. <laughs> so when, when uh, this before, when I put him between the door, he knew where he, he felt already that they were in the living room. So then they, they left, and, and uh, they took my grandfather alone. We didn't sleep the whole night. We thought they were going to kill us. Well, I took the man and, and took him down the step to our cellar. We had coals there, coal. And I buried him there, just enough room to breathe. So the we didn't sleep the whole night. The following morning, my grandfather came back. They, they left him free because he was a philanthropist. He was doing a lot of good for the people. And the man there told him, that's the best man in town, don't you touch him. So he was very lucky he came back. It was already about 10 o'clock in the morning, and the man is downstairs. And I went down and I said, now is the time for you to, to go out. He said, nothing to me. I said, what do you mean? I said, you have a knife. He said, around, around lunchtime, around 12 o'clock, the, the guard is watching me the whole night. And when there'll be a lot of people, I'm going to mingle among them, and I'll get lost. So that was that. He was right. My grandfather was in touch. That was good. About five weeks after that, his wife came to see him. She went on her knees, and she told me I saved the life of a man with five children. She wanted to thank me. Wasn't that nice? So that was The third miracle is a little shorter. What is the third miracle? Oh, the third miracle is when my children would say, one day... You don't have to tell the whole story, just tell the miracle. <laughs> yeah. My two children got sick with infantile paralysis. She's one of them. And I, a, a miracle I had. I had a miracle. My son and she, one day, they had the best time in camp that year. And they were taken to the hospital, to the Kabbalists and all. One day, my son was freed. He was fine. He didn't have it in his feet. He had it in his throat. No, in his lungs. OK, my brother and I were stricken with polio during the big epidemic in 1943. And uh, we were both taken in separate ambulances. And my brother was in the iron lung for about four months. And I had. Uh, he had, uh, in his lungs, I had paralytic. I was paralyzed from the waist down. And he was in the hospital six months, and I was in the hospital eight months. And her miracle is that we were okay. 
Okay, so that's, <laughs> that's her miracle. And if you want to hear it all again, I will tell you that my um, I feel that the accept you. Oh, no, okay, my mother likes to tell, uh, but my mom, you know, though, you'll give away all your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, mother, uh, my mother's been interviewed uh, uh, and will be on actually PBS on KCET yes. in the fall. There is a, um, a series that's been uh, um, produced by two very nice young men. Bobby was, was volunteered to the Air Force. Right, yeah. Okay, uh, he was well enough to go in the Air Force is what she's saying. But anyway, um, and uh, the name of the series I think is called The um, Living Legend, something like that. But it's a series on centenarians. It'll be on in the fall. They made a, uh, um, the pilot was actually my mother. They filmed my mother and did all the research, has a lot of nice historic uh, uh, newsreel footage of the fire, and of course about the polio epidemic and the Cossack, so those are the three stories. And, um, but, but it's a wonderful video, and only 